Well, I'm going to ask that you would grab your copy of the Bible, whether that's digital or analog, as I have here. Um, and you would take and grab a copy and that you would turn to the last chapter of Genesis, the last chapter of Genesis. I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up. We're going to do things differently this morning. First of all, I'm not going to preach a long sermon. Can I get an amen? All right. We're going to start there. Uh, I'm going to share a message with you, however brief a pastor who says I'm going to do something quickly can do it. We'll see what happens. Uh, Who knows? We may have a miracle in that regard today. Then we're going to take some time and we're going to pray over this building. And we're going to pray over the faculty and the staff. We're going to pray over the students. We're going to pray over the families that are represented by the students. How many of y'all know that there's dysfunction in every family? Amen. And that includes every child that comes in here, but it also includes you teachers too. So come on, you're not off the hook. Dysfunction in every single family. Uh, It's just... What level of dysfunction, right? As long as there is sin in this world, there's imperfection, which means there's dysfunctional. Amen? And so, by the grace of God and by His power, Scripture says that love covers over a multitude of sins. So, He covers over. Wes Willett prayed this. I caught you talking in the back. Yeah, I like it when that happens. (laughs) Wes Wes Willett uh, said to me one time when we were sitting... uh, you know, we we're just kind of talking about family and praying. He said, man, I prayed this prayer. Lord, protect my child from me. And I don't know if you've ever prayed that prayer before, but what he's saying is, God, would you protect my children from my imperfections? Amen. Uh, but I love how scripture says that love covers over a multitude of sins. So if we will love, teachers, if you will love those children, it will cover over the things that, that you did wrong. Amen. By the grace of God, that happens. And so we praise God for that. Uh, any perfect parents in the house? Because I'm doing counseling. <laughs> it's, not, it's not possible, right? It, it, sometimes we think that our way is perfect, but yeah, praise God. Uh, he can correct that on us too. All right, so Genesis chapter 50, starting with verse 22. This is the... You, 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 we think, oh man, we hit the end of Joseph and his life. Well, his story doesn't end with his death. And so I want you to read this with me. Uh, Genesis chapter 50, verse 22. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And, and as you know, the majority of his life was in Egypt. He, so those are catching up. Joseph was part of a big family and his brothers despised him sold him into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. And in Egypt, he was wrongly convicted, thrown into prison for a number of years. And then God raises him up to fulfill a dream that he had when he was a child. So he becomes like one of the key leaders of Egypt. He's over all the food and the grain because he he had a vision, or God gave him the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. The dream said there's going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. There's going to be drought, and that's exactly what occurred. So Joseph was a part of the plan to help them save food. Well, it also saved his family's lives. They come and they see him in Egypt. They get food from from Joseph. And now they've moved here to be under the the guardianship and the protection of Joseph and of the Pharaoh. And so uh, Joseph, he lived 110 years, and Joseph saw uh, Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machar, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And it says, And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land. See, that is a statement of faith. That is a prophetic word that you're going to be leaving here. He says, um, He'll bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear. You all know that Jesus said, don't swear by anything, right? Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Um, He said, then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him. And he was put in a coffin in Egypt. You think that that's the end of the story. Do this. Fast forward 
to Exodus, to the next book. Look in chapter 13. Chapter 13. And we're going to start in verse 17. So we're going to go one book over. We've gone from Genesis, the end of Genesis, now into Exodus. There's been uh, 300 and probably about 90 years that have passed. We know that there's been, well, probably maybe 350 to 400. Because he said after 400 years, you're going to, you, the prophecy is that you'll be leaving here. All right? Well, now uh, Israel, the nation of Israel is leaving Egypt. And check this out. When Pharaoh let the people go, this is verse 17 in chapter 13. God did not lead them by the way, or, yeah, the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. How many of y'all wish that God would do that for you? Every battle. Would you just divert me around that? That would be awesome, God. Would you? God knows. Listen, if you're in a battle, it's because God knows you can handle it. I'm talking to somebody. Somebody need to hear that today. All right. God knows whether that's going to strengthen you or whether you're going to die in the midst of it. Amen. And he says, they can't handle it. So we're going to go around and says, but God led the people around the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Now, it says that Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear. There's that word again. He made them swear to do it, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. We're talking almost 400 years later. Now, can you imagine the conversation from generation to generation? Hey, Mike, I'm about to die. I need you to not forget Joseph's bones if you decide you're going to leave. All right? And then Mike goes, hey... Hey, Evan. Hey, Evan. Um, I'm about to die. Do me a favor and don't forget Joseph's bones if you leave. Generation after generation after generation after generation. Y'all, it doesn't end there. If you would turn with me to Joshua. Joshua chapter 24. This is the last chapter of Joshua. See, Moses had already passed away. He handed the leadership over. God called Joshua to follow uh, after Moses as the leader of Israel, right? Raised him up. Moses raised him up, mentored him for him to lead. And it says in this chapter, uh, Joshua chapter 24, starting with verse 32, as for the bones of Joseph, in case you were wondering what happened to him, right? As for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the piece of land that Jacob brought from the sons of Hamor, the, bought, sorry, from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. So these bones, listen, these bones, I want you to think about this. Tag, you're it. Don't forget Joseph's bones. Tag, you're it. Don't forget Joseph's bones. Tag, you're it. Don't. Moses, let's carry these things out of here, right? Can you imagine what happened? Now, just think about the conversation, right? We're going to send 12 spies in, and, and they send 12 spies in. Ten come back, and they say, we're not going to be able to go in there because we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. These people are mammoth. They're huge. We're going to lose a battle to them. There's no way we can move forward, right? And so two people... Joshua and Caleb said, we can surely do this because it's already promised. Well, as you know, they weren't able to enter because they didn't believe. It comes back to faith again. I want you all to know that. It comes back to faith again. They didn't have the faith to move forward. So you know what they did? For 40 years, they wandered in the desert carrying Joseph's bones. Hello? Because they buried them when they went into the promised land. Which meant, could you imagine the battles, okay? Hey, we're going to go out, we're going to fight this battle. I need a couple guys to just watch his bones real quick. Or, let's go, and then we're like, oh man, we just advanced. This is awesome. Hey, could you send some people back and get his bones real quick? I mean, it's like this constant thing. They're having to carry his bones from one place because he made them swear that they would not forget. Y'all, it's not done there. Let's go to the New Testament, Hebrews. Chapter 11. 
You're like, man, they talk a lot about his bones in the Bible. They do. And bones and bones. That, never mind. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. If you got it, say, oh, I got it. There is zero confidence in this room right now. Say, I got it. Hebrews 11, verse 22. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites, and he gave directions concerning his bones. Here's the deal. God, you need to understand something about this chapter in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 is not about bones. It's about faith. Joseph was not commended because he told him to take his bones. He was commended because he had faith that they were going to be leaving. And that is proof in all of the verses that we just added up. All right? And here's the problem is, we oftentimes take, when we're looking forward, and we carry things with us that died a long time ago. There. You know what I'm talking about. Like, there's we, something that died. Listen, and I want you to understand something. I'm not talking about moral issues. Okay? God doesn't change his standard on moral things. Sin is sin. Right? Scripture calls sex out of marriage sin. I don't care what culture says. That's what it says, right? I mean, you could go down the list of things that culture is trying to change. And, and even gluttony. Come on. Homosexuality, you go down the list, all of them. But we have a tendency to point one out, the one we don't like. Sin is sin. And God doesn't change that. Listen, that's, you don't know why? Because if we will live life the way God wants us to live, then it will give us life. He, he, he does that not because he's trying to make our life miserable or to keep us from being cool in our culture. He does it because he knows that the wages of sin is death. Right? But oftentimes what we do is we take things that are opinion and we call them a moral standard. The songs that we sing today, the next generation may have new ones. Oh, come on. They, they may have new ones, right? And you may have had others that you grew up on, right? We can't force things like that on everybody. Those are things that we, listen, we just continue to worship God and to love Him and move forward. But can I tell you, there are some things that you just have to go, all right, that's like carrying bones. Some things. And the reason I'm saying that is, we've done five years of ministry here, and there's a chance that we're going to get there. I would, Cindy, I'd almost guarantee it. We're going to get there, and somebody, you're, they weren't here this Sunday. Right? They weren't here this Sunday, but we're going to get there. And somebody's going to say, well, we didn't do it that way in Riverside. <laughs> and I'll be like, you should have showed up for that Sunday. I preached on that already. Right? No. Well, we didn't do it that way in Riverside. Is that a matter of opinion? Is that really more of a preference? Or is that a biblical standard? Right? Is it a preference, or is this something that God says is sin? If it's sin, we're going to call it what it is. Amen? And can I tell you, we're not the one calling sin, sin. God is. It's His Word. And when it's all said and done, our culture's not going to sit on the throne. God is. I'm not going to sit on the throne of your life. God is. But as a preacher of the Word of God, I'm called to preach the Word of God. Amen? When it comes down, listen, when it comes down to some of these preferences, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this story. Is Christian in here? First of all, tell him he should have been in church today. Amen? <laughs> yeah, he's playing the drums, people. Like, where'd he go? Oh, would somebody call him out later? I think it would be a beautiful thing, but he's probably coming to the second service. But Christian, uh, one Sunday I came in here, Christian was playing drums and he was wearing a hat up front. Okay, it's two strikes against him because I was born and raised in the South, and I was prior military. You with me on that? So I started praying about it. I'm like, okay, 
Should he be wearing a hat up there? Have any of y'all ever had that wonder? Have any? All right. So, so I was like, all right. Then I went, okay, is this a biblical standard or is this a preference? And I just started to pray about it. Y'all, I'm telling you what, that was a struggle for me. Southern Baptist pastor, traditional church, that's where I started, you know. And I went back into a room. I kid you not, I went back into one of these rooms. I prayed in one of y'all's rooms. I don't know. I got on my knees and I said, God, I need to know the things that are worth fighting for. And the things, you know what the Lord told me? He, the Lord spoke to me and he said, that young man loves me and is worshiping me. That's what he told me. And he said, and if it helps somebody else come to church that's wearing a hat, then so be it. But if you say something to him, you could lose him. Now, when it comes to sin, is what it is. Amen? God calls it what it is, and sometimes people are not going to want to do anything. They're not going to want to be a part of our life because we want to live on the narrow road. Amen? Wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many will find it, but narrow is the road that leads to eternal life, and few will find it. That's unfortunate, but that's the word. So what we have to do is we have to constantly pray about how much of this is just carrying along bones and how much of this is living in faith. Because Joseph was commended for his faith. The entire chapter is about faith, y'all. That's how I know that. The whole chapter of Hebrews 11 is about faith. He defines faith as the substance of things. He talks about without faith it is impossible to please God. The whole chapter is about faith. And Joseph was commended on his faith. So can I tell you this? Let's take our faith with us. Let's take our faith with us. And then when it comes down to... You know, some of these things that are preferences and stuff like that. Let's just go, okay, God, help us to love. Amen? Are y'all with me on this? Because this is the direction we're going. This is the direction we're going. We're about to leave Riverside. If any of y'all come to me and say, well, we didn't do it that way at Riverside. (laughs) You know my answer. Is it preference or is this a faith issue? Amen? Because that's the thing that's the most important. Listen, we have, we have been blessed with God's favor. Y'all know that? What has happened here is because God has been here. And man, we got to be so careful not to take credit for what God's doing. The only one that deserves any glory is Him. Would you stand with me? We're going to mobilize you. We're going to mobilize you. We are going to pray over this building. We've got about 10 minutes that we're going to do that. Um, So here's what I want you to do. Y'all can split up. You just need to know the children are in the gym. It's off limits. They're going to pray in there. The preschool is the, the hallway that goes back. The preschool leaders are going to be praying back there. And the reason is, is because we're keeping our children safe and secure. I'll never apologize for the safety and security of our children. Amen? So what we want to do is we want you, if you would, to go down this hallway. There are yellow stickies on the frames of the doors. When you're finished praying with that, over that classroom or over that office space, would you pull that sticky so we know it's been prayed over? What we'll do is we'll go back after this service and we're going to put them back up there and the next service we'll be praying as well. Amen? Um, Do it this way. Just go as God leads you. Walk the halls. Pray not just for the children, not just for, pray for every aspect of the people, of their lives, of the people that come up and down these halls every single day. And then would you do one more thing? Everybody look at me. Would you do one more thing? Would you pray, God, how would you use me here at Riverside? Because they still need people to read with kids. They still need mentors to be a part of their lives. We still need people to work in Discovery Club. Um, I, it's been asked, what are, what's Riverside going to do when y'all leave? Listen, they haven't been coming every single Sunday. Where they see us is throughout the week. Melody, are you reading with first or second grade this year? First grade, and you have for five years? Four years. Five years. They know her in the hallways because she's here, 
throughout the week. And so opportunity for you to come and be a blessing to these children and to their family. Pray as you're going down, God, how would you have me be a part of partnering with them as well? Would y'all make that your prayer? All right, go.